department seminar this year. And uh, this is um, my first time kind of organizing this sort of thing, so I realized that I messed up and forgot the treats. <laughs> so maybe I won't have them again. <laughs> I apologize. But today uh, we will be um, mathematically fed. <laughs> taking a graph apart and putting it back together. Thank you very much. Well, it's, it's nice to see you all here, and it's, uh, it's a joy to talk about uh, one of my favorite, uh, favorite mathematical topics. And uh, as I was thinking about this talk, uh, I was thinking about a good metaphor, and, and, and this made me think of it because my kids and I we love jigsaw puzzles. And this is the, <laughs> the jigsawpuzzle.com. And, and, and it's a good way of, uh, if you think about how a jigsaw puzzle works. So here's the one of the day, the jigsaw puzzle of the day. <coughs> right? You could not, so if it happens. Yep, so there's the picture, and they break up into pieces, and then they're all spread apart. Right? And so you have these things, that, these uh, different things that are happening in a jigsaw puzzle. Right? You have that whole picture, which is kind of your target. Right? And you know that going in, what your, what your target is. And then you have all these pieces that you're supposed to put together. Uh, I don't have enough time to do this now. You can do this if you want to. So I'm going to point. But I kind of wanted to show you that just to show you how I, I, I was sort of thinking about this and uh, how it helps me, kind of, helps us, might help us kind of think about how to, how to think about some of the problems. All right. So what are the expenses of the jigsaw puzzle? Well, let's think about it. You need a collection of pieces that you're allowed to use, right? And, and in, in, that, in most cases, in the, the physical case, whatever's in the box. Right? And, and that's all you have. I actually, it's really restrained because you can only use the pieces once and you can't like bend them to make them fit in the right way no matter how hard you try. Um, my, my, my children always give me a hard time when I try to do that. Um, you need rules for putting the pieces together. Right? In this case, but again, the rules are pretty rigid in a real jigsaw puzzle. It'll be a little bit looser when we start talking about graphs. Uh, and the third thing is you need a criterion for being finished. And that's kind of what they start on that picture, right? That's, the, that's the, the picture is complete. You have your final picture, you have your target picture. And we're going to apply this process to graphs. Um, I think pretty much everybody in here knows what a graph is, but I'm going to say, if you don't, just in case you don't, I'm going to say it anyway. So here's a picture of a graph, a, a visual representation of a graph. And uh, in general, the, uh, the abstract definition is you have a pair of sets, V and E. Uh, v is a set called the vertex set, and that's represented by the dots up there. And that could be any set. Uh, we, we just represent them by dots, traditionally. And then uh, the elements of, of uh, the vertex set are called vertices. Uh, e is a set called the edge set that contains unordered pairs. And up there in the picture, the unordered pairs are represented by the lines drawn between the vertices. So, in a 345, you might so let's look at this graph a little closer and see how we can think of it as a puzzle. So I'm going to think of this as, as my final picture, my puzzle. And you can actually think of it in terms of these three pieces. So I, it, it doesn't look exactly right. So you're right, I have to move them around and I have to bend the uh, bend those one to three a little bit. And then there's an additional rule that, if this is the rules about putting them together, I'm going to think of this one here as having like snaps on it. Oh, a crafter. I, I really wish I would bring something with snaps on it, put it together. But you can snap this vertex on this one, this one, this one. I'll show you how that works. Yay, there it snapped. Mm -hmm. All I have is PowerPoint and, uh, <laughs> and Beamer to help me out. So, so that, that, those are the rules for putting them together. You can see that more or less they're the same picture. The one on the bottom is a little stressed out. But that's okay. We're going we're gonna to say that I'm, not, I'm done with that. All right. And again, I want you to notice that these pieces that we had, they're all graphs themselves. So the, the end picture, the end puzzle is a graph, and the little pieces that you use are also graphs. Okay. So, uh, to, to talk about this mathematically, uh, let G be any graph and let T be a set of graphs. And we're going to think of G as the finished puzzle, the final picture. We're going to think of T as the box, right? The set of pieces that we use to actually make the puzzle. Um, again, with a little bit looser rules, uh, we put the graphs on uh, N T on G by sort of snapping the vertex vertices onto the vertices of G, as we did before. And finally, this is a little bit different than your normal puzzle, is we can use as many copies of the graphs of T as we want. So if we have one piece that we really like, we can make copies of it and use it again. But there is one little rule, and that is you do have to use every piece in the box. 
at least once. Just have at least one in the T. And then if you want to give a proper mathematical definition, uh, these are called T multi decompositions, and this is the partition of the edges of G into copies of graphs of T in which each graph T is used at least once. So in each of the partitions, you'll have a copy of the graph, and when you put them all together, you get the whole graph. So let's, let's look at this as our final picture. Uh, it's a lovely, lovely graph. I like this one. And uh, here are our pieces. Here are our piece. Just one piece. We have this triangle that we're going to use over and over and over again. Not the most exciting puzzle you ever saw in your life, but uh, well, that's the best I can do on PowerPoint. Give me a break. All right, so we're going to start here. These are the seven vertices. And we're just going to start filling in triangles. There's one. Notice I sort of stressed it out into a different shape. That's OK. That's part of the rules. Not like the regular pieces. They won't break or rip or anything like that. Uh, they're very stretchy. Right? There's another one. Oh, let me say, we'll let that one cool down before I put down the next one. There's the third one, and we're going to keep on going. There's another one. We keep on putting in triangles until we get all the edges. Now, we can't use an edge twice. That would be against the rules. And we're going to keep going until we get to the end. Are we to the end yet? Yes, we're to the end. Okay, and we get the whole one by putting in various copies of the uh, triangles. Make sense? Okay, and this is, uh, you know, this graph actually is. This is a nice graph. I like this graph. This is a, a complete graph, uh, seven vertices. And it's very, very common in, uh, in graph decompositions that your, your finished piece, your finished puzzle, is usually a complete graph. So let's go ahead and talk about those. Uh, these are things that most people in the room probably know about. But we use, we use complete graphs, and to define that, um, it's just a graph. We'll call it Kn. It has n vertices, where n is at least two. Right? It has n vertices. And uh, every uh, pair of vertices has precisely one edge between it. So here are two pictures. That is the complete graph K7 that we saw before. Seven vertices and all the, all the edges are there. But the one over on the right that's missing some edges, so that, that one's not complete. All right. So here's a fun uh, counting problem. Yeah, most of us in here know the answer to this one. But how many edges does K have? This is going to be important to us later. Um, well, let's count. Uh, so one way of counting them is you can say you have n vertices. Uh, each vertex shares an edge with n minus one other vertices, right? Because you have one for each one. And so that means there are uh, n times n minus one edges, right? Oh, okay, you're right. Not right. Not right. Sorry. Yeah, not right. Yeah, because what happens is you, each edge gets counted twice, right? So if we have two vertices, B and W, each edge gets counted as an edge coming out of B, and each one in the same edge gets counted as an edge coming out of W. So we each count them twice, so yeah, I'm going to divide by two. Sorry about that. Let's that one out. All right. Great. Uh, so the research that I do with my colleagues uh, has to do with the question of what if you want to use more than one type of puzzle piece. Right? So we were using just triangles before. Right? And, that's, and there's actually a really rich, uh, rich history of really interesting problems of de graph decomposition with just one, one puzzle piece. Uh, those are, they can be really hard problems, but we were looking forward to do more than one. And in particular, the big question comes up is how do you choose the pieces? Now, one way you can do it is you can just say, ah, I'll choose my favorite two or three graphs. Those will be my pieces, and then see what happens. Right? You could do that. Uh, but uh, Agueda and Devon found a more uh, systematic way of finding puzzle pieces. OK, so you take, what you do is you take a fixed, complete graph KT. Now, this KT isn't necessarily going to be the one we're going to use as our final puzzle. We're just going to use it to find the pieces. Okay? And the way we find the pieces is we take those edges and break them up into two sets. Right, so take, partition them into two sets. Each one is going to be a graph, right? H1 and H2. But we have some rules, because we don't just want any two graphs. We want to make sure that H1 and H2 use all the vertices of KT. And what I really mean by that is all T vertices in KT should have an edge. Each one should have an edge in H2, and each one should have an edge in H1. Right, so, so each graph should, be, should not have any isolated vertices in KT. Okay. And then the second thing that should happen, they shouldn't be copies of the same graph. I mean, this would be a big, long, not very pleasant process of finding one graph that we already knew how to do anyway. Right? So, so we want to make sure that there are really two different puzzle pieces. All right, so uh, the, the terminology that we use is if G, H1, and H2 are graphs, uh, and if T is greater than or equal to 2, we call uh, H1, if H1 and H2 partition KT, 
if each vertex of KT is incident with some edge in each HI, and finally, if H1 and H2 are not isomorphic graphs, in other words, they're different, then we call H1 and H2 a graph pair of order T. So we kind of have two questions to, to worry about here. First of all, if we're given a T, what are the graph pairs that we can get? What are the, what, how many different boxes can we get for our puzzle? And then the second question is, once we have our pieces, what kind of puzzles can we make out of them? So we're going to do the first one, look, look at what kind of boxes we can get. And just to make things not too, not too crazy, we're going to look at graph pairs of order four. So we're going to look at K4, we're going to break it up into two graphs, and see how many are going to actually satisfy all the rules of being, <coughs> excuse me, a graph pair of order four. <coughs> oh, that was not fun. All right, so let H1 and H2 be some kind of graph pair, <coughs> excuse me, of order four. Uh, and just to make things uh, organized, let's just suppose that H1 has the smallest number of edges between the two. Okay, so now the first question we may ask is how many edges can H1 have? And in particular, what's the smallest number of edges? Well, you can't have just one. Because if you have one edge that's two vertices between them, you have two isolated vertices, right? You, you get all four. So that's not really. Yeah, you need all four. And so if it has two edges, then you can do two edges, but they cannot share a vertex. Because if you have two edges sharing a vertex, you actually only get three vertices. We need all four. Then that's nice. So yeah, so sharing results in three vertices. Uh, and that means your H1 would have to use this particular graph. And I do want to point out, this is really is one graph. It has two isolated edges, but it's really one graph. They come in pairs. Okay, all the time. Okay? All right, so here's what H1 would look like in K4. Yeah, you can see the colors pretty well. See these two, two red edges over here? That's, that's our H1. And then H2 is whatever's left over, right? We've got to split them into two pieces. And there's H2. Oh, here, let me untwist that for you. There you go. Uh, looks like K or, uh, cycle of four on four vertices. So there's one modulate, and obviously those are not isomorphic. And they both use all four vertices, so that's great. That's great. So we have ourselves a graph pair of order four. And in fact, that's the only way you can do it if the smallest one has two edges. Okay? Well, can H1 have three edges? That's a good question. So let's see if we can answer that. Well, let's put it in two cases. The first cases are if our H1 looks like this. In other words, all three edges share a common vertex. Uh, that one's actually going to cause us problems if we put the other edges in of K4 and then split them apart. Whoops. That red one only has three vertices. Oh, good. So that means at least two of them, at least two of the edges are not connected to one another. Right? So something like this. See the red ones? Right? That's not the whole graph. I'm missing an edge. But at least two of them have to be, have to, uh, be separate. Okay. Now, the thing to notice is I have to add a third edge somewhere. And it's got to be one of the remaining four. But no matter which one I add, it's always going to be, uh, it's always going to be a path graph. So if I added this one, for instance, if you have a path here, to here, to here, to here. And similarly with any of these other three. So I'm going to choose the one that looks like an N. I don't know why, so that, that was kind of fun. But there's our N, right? And then the idea of a, a, a path of length one, two, three. And let me go ahead and split that up. And there's your, it, it looks pretty good almost. Uh, we have two graphs. They use all the vertices. There are no isolated vertices on either of those graphs. Um, yeah, let me turn the, the left one sideways. That, they're, they're the same graph. Mm -hmm. So we, have, we just have one puzzle piece. And that's no fun. So we can't have any graph pairs where one of them has three edges. Um, H1 can't have four edges either because there are only six edges all together. And if H1 is supposed to be the smallest one, uh, that's too many edges. Right. So that's all we got. That's our only graph pair of order four. Uh, we have two times P, two P2 is what we call the two isolated edges, and then C4 is, is what we call the four cycle. So it seems like you have some aim in mind here. How come you can't have the same? How come each one and each two can't be on some Well, because then you have the same puzzle piece in your, in your uh, okay. box. What's wrong with that? Well, then you can just say, let's have one puzzle piece and let's use it. So we, we like, I mean, the, the whole point of this was to have a puzzle with more than one piece, more than one type of piece. 
So if you do one, if you have one piece, that's, I mean, that those are the gravity composition problems. Those have, been, those have already been looked at a lot for in the last uh, 60 years or so. And so what we were, what, what actually with uh, way that Dan we're looking for is ways of finding uh, uh, graphs that have, uh, that, are, that are different, that are different, different from one another. Yes. I forget. Are you allowed in your H1 or H2? Do you have an isolated vertex? You cannot have an isolated vertex. That's, that's one of the things I've done. Because I'm having trouble doing this with K3. Yeah, you can't. K3, oh, okay. K, K4 is actually the smallest okay. uh, complete graph for which you can have a graph pair. All right, I feel better now. Yeah. And we have one graph pair. Yeah, one graph pair of order four. There are actually five graph pairs of order five, and Wade and Dad have looked at both of those types of pieces. So that's six boxes that they that they looked at in their. Uh, this, this is uh, back in the early 2000s. So that's just finding the pieces, right? Now we've got to figure out which puzzles we can make. So now the question becomes, which complete graphs have multi-decompositions of graph pairs of order four? So for which complete graphs can we actually use these puzzle pieces to make the whole picture? And it turns out not, not that many of them. All right, so here are H1 and H2. Uh, and the thing, one thing to keep in mind about H1 and H2 is, well, H1 has two edges, H2 has four edges, so any way that you put them together, you're always going to have an even number of edges. Right? So that's going to leave out a lot of complete graphs. Right? That means that this number that we derived before, this n times n minus 1 over 2, has to be an even number. Okay, so when is that going to happen? Well, if n is even, we can write the number of edges as n over 2 times n minus 1. Uh, n being even means n minus 1 is going to be odd, which means that n over 2 has to be even. But that means that n has to be multiple of 4. If n is odd, we can do the kind of the same thing. Now we're writing the number of edges as n times n minus 1 over 2. n is odd now, which means that n minus 1 over 2 has to be even. n minus 1 over has to then be a multiple of 4, which means that n is one more than multiple of 4. So we've narrowed it down, down considerably. There's a lot of complete graphs that aren't even, aren't even candidates simply because they don't have this right number of edges. Well, can these, so, so here's the, the sort of half theorem we get. If uh, you have a multi-decomposition of order 4, then n is either 4k or 4k plus 1. Right. So let's look at the multiples of 4. Uh, let me see, so k4 is the easiest one. Well, come on, we, we, we got it from k4, right? Mm -hmm. So of course you can do that. Yeah, so that, was, that was easy, that was boring. All right, so what about k8? Is that boring? That's not quite boring. Uh, except that, you know, k8 does have 28 edges, and I don't want to fill in the whole thing. Mm -hmm. It was hard enough generating these pictures as it is. I don't want to go through all those. So I want to use some of my previous cases. Being, being induction people, we kind of understand this. And I'm going to uh, organize it like this. So imagine the top, right? The top, we look at all the edges that go along the ones on the top. That's going to form a copy of K4. But we just show that you can do a multi-decomposition of that. So imagine it done. Okay. Same with the bottom. Right? Imagine it done. So, so far we have two, two four cycles and two of the two P2s that we put in, and that takes care of ones on the top and ones on the bottom. And now all that's left are the uh, edges that go between. Right? So that's the, that graph is the complete bipartite graph, K4-4. Four, four. Okay. Right, so I'm not even going to bother with the ones on the top and bottom, just the ones in between, and I'm actually going to fill in, and this is actually important, with four cycles. So there's a four cycle I, I twisted it for you. So there's one four cycle, let it cool down, and then I'm going to uh, stretch it to the right, and then I'm going to do the exact same thing with the other two, right? Stretch that one to the left, and then down. So that takes care of everything, right? The top got taken care of by the, and bottom by the K4 case, and then the middle got taken care of, we just, we just did it. Okay, that's great. Let's look at K12. K12, we're going to do the same thing, right? We're going to have four vertices on the top, eight vertices on the bottom, we just did K8, that's our induction hypothesis, right? So we're going to consider those done. And then, or actually, we're going to take a step further. Right? I'm going to ignore the, the four vertices on the right on the bottom and just look at what remains. And that's just K44 again, the exact same thing we just filled in, right? So we did it. It's done. And the nice thing is, the ones remaining after that are again K44. So again, that's done as well. And so now you can see K16 is going to work the same way. You're going to have 12 on the bottom, they're done. Four on the top, it's done. And then you have what? One, two, three, three, three. Three copies of K44, which you fill in exactly the same way. Okay. 
So that takes care of all multiples of four. So they're all possible. We all get multiple decomposition for everyone. Ah, so let's look at when we have one more than a multiple of four. Now let's see. Let's start with k five. This is the hardest one. Now we need at least one of each, right? One, uh, at least one four cycle, and at least one of the two p twos. So let me put in the four cycle. It doesn't matter what I put. I mean, nice thing about complete graphs is you have lots of symmetry, so I can put it wherever I want, right? So there it is. Now my first question is, can I put another one, in, another four cycle? Well, I certainly can't fit it in using those same four vertices, right? So at least one of the edges of my other four cycle has to be that red one over there, right? And in fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep walking along my four cycle until I get back to where I started, right? So here's my first part of my walk. Now my second one, I can't go there, so I've been taken. Can't go there. That's my only, that's my only, only path to take on my, on my four cycle walk. And now I'm running into the exact same problem. I've, I've, uh, that the vertex that I just got to, there's only one edge left that, that hasn't been taken up. And that's that one there. Uh, unfortunately, that's a, not a four cycle, but a three cycle. So even if I wanted to, I could put in a second four cycle. So if there is a possibility that I have a, a multi-decomposition, um, it's going to be one four cycle, that's four, and then I have six more left over, and that's going to be three of the two P2s. So let's go ahead and fill in the two P2s. Whoops, okay, that's one four cycle. Now, I can't do that, obviously. Right? No sharing vertices. So what I have to do is something like that. Now, that's just one of the edges of my 2P2. The other one is somewhere else. But for sure, it does not include this vertex. Somewhere among the other four. So that's one of them. Now, the second one also has to have, you know, it has to have another one that has one of those edges. Because every edge coming out of that uh, lower right vertex has to be has to be in, in somewhere. So there, there's the second one. Again, the other edge, I don't know where it is. It's one of the other ones. But for sure, it does not include that lower right vertex. And then there's my third one, and I'm done. Only uh, I'm missing one, that, that bottom one, right? And so I'm really not done. So that, that, that's impossible. So K5, I can't do. So that's the best. What about K9? Uh, well, I'm going to do this, right? And the reason I'm going to do this is because we've already done K8. Right? We did that in the multiples of four case. So consider that done. And then that only leaves me, um, oh yeah, all these vertices going from this, or all these edges going from this one down to here. Uh, yeah, that's problematic because I can't fit any four cycles in there. And I can't, I can't even fit in the 2P2. Well, here's what I'm going to do. Now, uh, this recalls, this means we have to recall something about the way we constructed K, the, the multi-decomposition for K8. One of the things we did is we took each of these sets of four and did, did what we did on K4 of it. So in particular, each of those sets of four has a four cycle that was it part of that T multi-decomposition. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to keep everything the same, right? The same multi-decomposition before, except I'm taking out those two cycles. I'll have to put them in again at some point, but I'm taking them out because, because I've got to create some space for myself. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to fill in the rest of the edges with copies of 2P2. Right, so here's one of them. Uh, there's one coming down. I don't know if you saw that one turn black over there on the left. That's the other one. So I've got to do these in pairs, right? That's, that's how the graph works. And then every time I do this, I'm going to have one going up and down, and then one, one of the green ones turning black. There's four of them. And there's the other four. Look, I was, I was smart. I got rid of those so I could create some room there. Yeah. Smart me, And then I'm done. They're all the edges. Now, there's something that should make me a little bit nervous about this particular what I just did. Um, and that is, what, what did I do? I took out two four cycles and replaced them with a bunch of two P2s. I, I've got to make sure, I mean, I, there is a danger that all I have done was just take out all the four cycles and replace them with all, so now I have something with all two P2s. I've just been using one type of puzzle piece. Yeah, let me see if, if you're going to remember what happened before. Did that happen in this case? Yeah, and you have to remember what happened when we filled in, so, so these came from decomposing K4s, right? But then we had the ones between the top and the bottom. Do you remember what we filled those in with? Four cycles, right? 
Okay, so, so we're okay. So we have, we have what? One, two, three, four, four cycles in there from, from doing the KH. And so this, this turns out to be a really powerful technique when you're constructing these multi-decompositions. So let's sort of describe what happened here. Right? So the first thing we did was here, we arranged the vertices of K9 into two sets, one with eight vertices and one with one. Okay? The edges among the eight vertex uh, set that forms the KA, which we already did. So we say it's done, induction, right? Except that we take out copies of one or more of the graphs uh, in, that, uh, in that set of graphs, in that graph pair, that we know to be in K8. And, we, and actually, we, in this case, we need to know them more. We need to know where they were. Right? We need to know one was in that first set of four vertices and one was in that second uh, set of four vertices. Incidentally, this is sometimes not easy to do. It's sometimes impossible to do. This is something that uh, gave us fits when we are working on other problems. And then we use these edges in addition to the ones that we needed to fill in anyway to, to fill out the rest of the uh, edges of K9. And then at the end, we made sure that we had at least one of each graph. Right? That the ones we took out were either replaced later or there were more that we didn't take out. In this case, there were more that we didn't take out. Okay. All right. So and this gives us uh, Wieda and Davin's theorem. This is from, oh, I should put the year. I think it's back in 2002, 2003, somewhere around there. Um, you always have a T multi decomposition board for as long as, precisely when uh, you have a multiple of four vertices in your complete graph, or one more than multiple of four, except for you can't have five. And I, sort of, I, I showed you K9, but there's the same kind of recursive construction of these multi-decompositions that you can use as well. Uh, modulo 4, right? Oh. Well, what if we want to use three different kinds of graphs? And in fact, this is the problem that I uh, have worked on with my collaborators and that we actually continue to work on. So this problem has a lot of legs. Well, we construct them in the same way, right? We have, uh, we take a complete graph, KT, we take that, now we break the, the edges up into three different sets. Each one forms a, a, a different uh, graph. Different in that they have to be mutually non-isomorphic. Uh, and not only that, but there can't be any isolated vertices. Right? So, so they have to, each of those graphs has to touch each of the vertices in the complete graph. And then, uh, what's the third thing? Thanks, uh, the third thing is that they partition the edges of okay, KT. And then we call that a graph triple board T. So now we're dealing with a, uh, a puzzle that has, uh, where the box has three pieces that we can make copies of. Right? And we're still trying to get a final picture of a complete graph, and we know, want to know which complete graph will work for various ones. Okay? So this doesn't seem like too much worse than what we had, right? So we, we had graph pairs border four, there was one of them. Graph pairs border five, I didn't, I didn't derive this, but I'm not going to, but five of those. All right, so we have triples, how bad can those be? Well, uh, first of all, the smallest complete graph for which you have any graph triples is going to be uh, K6. So that's what we saw. Great, we'll do K6. And we got 131 <laughs> graph triples of order 6. So we're thinking, wow, this is going to be a big long paper with 131 theorems. It's not. Don't worry like that. It's not, it's not. Yeah, yeah. So, so don't panic, don't panic. There is something that can be done. Not, not all is awesome. We can do something. And let, let me show, give you an example of the type of reasoning that we use. Alright, so here's K6. And you're going to color the edges so that you can see the... You, you can't see the graph. Okay, so there, there, there's, 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 a triple. there's a triple. And you have like some squigglies on the left and squigglies on the right. But one I really like, and I like this one in the middle, I seem to like P2. So this is not two P2s like the last one, this is three P2s. Okay, so, so this is one possibility of what you can have for a graph triple. And let's see what the, what the proof of, of, you know, the proof of finding all the T multi, or all the K edge for which there's a T multi decomposition looks like. So let's start with K6. All right, you already know what's going to happen, right? There's my three, there's my second one, there's my third one. For crying out loud, these came from K6, so of course there's going to be a multi decomposition. So I feel kind of silly in putting that up. Okay, fine, fine, da, da, da. Yeah, okay, that's fine. All right, so now let's go from K6 to K9. So we're skipping by three this time, not by four. 
Alright, so we like to do the same thing as we did before. You can see I have the same kind of picture, right? I have the six on the bottom, so there's our K6, and we just sort of do our multi decomposition there. So that leaves us with three edges up top, and then, what, 18 edges going from top to bottom. And, uh, and I didn't like those squiggly graphs on the side, so I want to stick with 3P2, which is no problem. Except that eventually I'm going to have to start taking care of those edges on the top, and that is a problem. Right? What I'm my third one? Without sharing a vertex. Can't, unless it's on the bottom. That's okay though, right? Because we, we've run into this situation before where we can take stuff out and, and put other stuff back in. So I'm going to take out my three, P, three P2s uh, from, from the bottom. Now I'm kind of playing without a net here because that was my only 3P2 that was in my multi-decomposition, K6, right? There was only one. So now I have nothing left except for those other two graphs, right? Those other two squiggles. But that's okay, okay, so um, I feel a little nervous, but there, there's my 3P2s. I feel a lot better now, right? Because I, I just basically I took one out and I put another one back in. Okay, so that one to cool down. And then do the same thing with one of the other green ones on the bottom. And, and, and one of the ones coming up and down, and one of the ones on top, and then the same thing with the third, right? And then the rest of them are all going up and down. There's one, up and down, up and down, up and down, we finished yet? So, right? So there we go. So the rest we can just go with 3P2s. And oh, one, other, one more, sorry, sorry. Didn't mean to leave you out. So that's K9. And then uh, some observations on what we've done in here. Well, the first thing you probably notice is that we can do the same thing with K12, right? Do nine on the bottom, taking out three, and then doing, playing that same kind of game for K15, and, and in particular, anything that's a multiple of three, so like zero on three. Okay. So that's great. So that takes care of infinitely many of the, of the KNs. Um, and that means we only have to figure out uh, where you're one more than a multiple of three or two more. That's uh, one mod three or two mod three. And then the other thing you may notice is that we have this one graph triple that we were working with, this one box, this one puzzle box. But we really, all, as far as the proof is concerned, we only, only one of the pieces showed up in the proof. That was the one with the three P2s, right? So really, I could have repeated that proof with any graph triple, as long as one of the graphs in there was the three P2s. And that's awesome, because there are 26 of those. So, I, out of the 131, just with the, I, I gave you a partial proof, I took care of, at least for multiples of three, 26 graph triples out of the 131. Which, which is a, a tremendous relief. Tremendous relief. Right. So, of course, we have to still do one and, and two mod three. I'll, 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 I'll do one mod three. Yeah, and we should start with K7. Uh, we'll start with K10. K7 is hard. K7 is hard. So I'm not going to K7 here. I'll do K10. And actually, K10 even easier than K9. We've got an extra one on top. So filling that in with uh, three P2s is no problem at all. And so keep doing the same thing we did. We put in three P2s, three P2s, three P2s. And that takes care of the ones on top. And then we just up and down, up and down. Down. Is there one more? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, yep. Same kind of thing happened. And then again, you have these recursive constructions. You go from 10 to 13, 13 to 16, and inducing gives you everything you need. All right. And, this, and so our final theorem on this particular one, where just one of the graphs was three P2s, went something like this. And this was with, I, I, I owe a great debt to my collaborators, uh, Adam Apoyda, Mike Gavin, uh, Vika and Vizakov and, and Stephanie Edwards. I have many other deaths besides mathematical uh, who, who worked on this while I was at, at the University of Dayton. And uh, so if you have a graph triple of order six where the H1, the first one, is the one with three isolated edges, that's our 3P2. Uh, if you have, if it is an integer at least six, less than six, we have no prayer of having a multi decomposition because it's too small. If n is a multiple of 3, then the kn has a t multi decomposition. We saw that. Uh, if n is one more than a multiple of 3, but not 7, then it always has a t multi decomposition. So 10 and up. Um, well, 
it's hard to give you the precise statement of what happened in K7 if I can't show you all the triple. I'm not going to. But the, 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 the upside of it is sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Okay. And then next, uh, if there's a certain problem that can happen if you are, are 2 mod 3 and if H2 and H3 both have 6 edges. And what happens there is if H2 and H3 have 6 edges, H1 has 3 edges, you're always going to get a multiple of 3. Uh, and unfortunately, 3K plus 2 is never a multiple of 3. So you have no chance of having multi-decomposition. But in all the other cases, as long as the arithmetic works out, right? Uh, in all the other cases, it does happen. And then I should note that we were talking about decompositions here, puzzles, but we actually uh, proved some results about what happens when you can't get the whole thing. And, and sort of uh, ways of, of, of doing it where you do the best that you can. So best that you can is, you means that you fill in as many of the edges as you can. That's called a, a multi-packing. Yes, multi-packing. And one where you use maybe one or two or, or so of the edges more than once. And that's called multi-cover. And all these three put together are called multi-designs. So if you see my paper, you see multi-designs, where's the multi-decompositions? Multi-designs encompasses all those things. It encompasses these, these multi-decompositions. It encompasses the multi-packings and the multi covers So and we determined that for all of these that, that we did. So we don't come just to the ones where there are the three times P2. We also, whoops. Okay, so here's our final results. Uh, we also did the ones where, and this is work with, uh, I, I, I mentioned my, my collaborators, this is back in 2006. Uh, we saw the bar for all triples where we had uh, one of the graphs had three edges, and that was the, the three P2. Or all the graphs had five edges. That was the, one of the, the other ones we did. And that took care of 38 triples. So actually, most of those came from the 3P2, right? There were 26 of those, and only, only 12 from the 5 edges. But you, you don't be deceived. The 5 edges was actually the hardest one. And, that, and most tedious at the end because you had yucky base cases to worry about. But in any case, you got 38 triples out of 131. That seemed, that, seemed, that seemed more impressive at the time. Uh, and then what we did is, uh, I was working, and this is not in 2006, I don't know how that, um, how that year got there. This was actually this year, and last year that I was working on this with uh, Stephanie Edwards and, and Charles Cuse. I don't know if you folks know him. He's, a, he's in the computer science department over at Um Actually, he helped us tremendously, because what happens in these proofs is, um, you know, a mathematician, you love the recursive instruction. And we had all these set up. It took us a while, but it was hard. We had all these set up, and then the base cases were just awful. I mean, first of all, we have, what was it, 93? I remember the two I think it was 93, 93 cases, uh, triples that we had to worry about. But that wasn't the bad part. Right? The bad part right, was how big they were. They, they were awkward number of edges that we had. They were like seven edge graphs that we had to fit in there, and it was just yucky. Right? And then that left us with a million, not a million, but a whole bunch of base cases. And, you know, we don't have any highly systemized ways of going through these. These are all ad hoc, right? We have to just five uh, multi decomposition. We, we use the force, you know, we, we do whatever we can to <laughs> try to figure out how to do these things. But uh, Charles, Charles Cusack helped us tremendously by, by giving us an algorithm that actually, okay, okay, here's the graph I want to fit in. I want to take out the six from the bottom and leave the other edges in there. Can you do that, right? And so, you know, crank, 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 no, 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 yes. Everyone's probably going to yes. And, and, and it really, really helped out our, our project a whole bunch. Uh, but we saw the problem for the remaining cases. And this we submitted this one uh, in June of this year. So I mean, we're looking at other types of problems. We're looking at other types of puzzles, actually. And the complete graphs, those are nice and pretty. And we like those as the final, final picture. Uh, but now we're, we're thinking, well, what if we can do some more interesting things? In, in particular, uh, a way that endowed have done things where they've they, they taken uh, various types of products and graphs, and uh, like, uh, like Cartesian products and, uh, and tensor products. I don't even know what those are. But they, they all have only neat products, and how, how can you do multi-decompositions of them and, and other types of multi-designs? And that's probably what we're going to be looking at. Uh, another possibility is actually, I mean, Graph triples order six. Why not graph triples order seven? Now that we have, now that we have Chuck, he can actually help generate those. Because those 131 triples, 
We did those all by hand. <laughs> yeah, I know. And it took a long time, and I, I missed, I, when, I was, when I was going through that, I missed like two or three that we had to come back and uh, cycle back later. So, so Chuck is going to help us with that. Good for Chuck. We'll keep him on the team. Uh, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm over early. I had no idea I'd be early. Are there any questions? Go. I was just wondering, in terms of um, what the computer scientists from Hope did for you, was that more of a, a brute force thing that here are, the, here are the graphs and we want to try and we suspect that we can use these graphs to build a, a K whatever. Is that a brute force same thing or was it some sophistication that um, used other observations or was I, it a matter of checking all I the actually, cases? I, I, I think it was a matter of checking all the cases. Okay. Like he, said, he said that kind of algorithm. Because we, all we really needed was we had all these base cases. Right? So for instance, I, if I, I'm trying to remember. So like for, for, for two mod, for K8, I forget, I, we're doing mod 6 or mod 8. I think we're doing mod 8 for our... Um, for our, for our induction, right? So we're doing eight, we had eight as one of our possibilities. Mm -hmm. And so we had the recursive constructions for that. Right. So you knew but we knew that. that we had all these possibilities that we had to go through. And so, you know, it, if we left us, there were going to be some cases where we have to do like one triple at a time. Because, yeah, I mean, we got lucky here, right? Because if you can get six on the bottom where you can say that's the triple and fill the other ones with just one type of graph, mm -hmm. that takes care of a whole bunch at once. Right. But there were some where we had to do do the pairs, mm -hmm. and then some where we had to do the whole triple, right? and that's just one at a time, and uh, and, and they were just simply awful. And so what happened? Two things happened when we, we, we used uh, Chuck's uh, software. First thing that happened is some of the ones that we just couldn't do, we didn't know how to do. Um, his his program could do, and then some of the ones that we thought we couldn't do, we had to use two of them to do. He got down to one. So that went from like, what, a multiple, order four, right? A multiple of four mm -hmm. um, shortening of the, of the proof. So, um, and so it, was, it was pretty amazing. We, 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 we had like months of work ahead. We were just, and, and with this program, we got done in a couple weeks. In May. It was awesome. Yeah. Can you back up a couple slides? Sure. Um, okay. It was the, that, that actually, yeah, right there. Okay, the last two cases. Um, the second to last one says if H2 and H3 both have six edges. Mm -hmm. The last one says if neither of H2 and H3 have six edges. Right. What if one of them has six you, edges? You, uh, let me see. Well, if you have, okay, so if your H1 has three edges, right, the other two have to add up to a multiple of three. So, I mean, your possibilities for three, you have 15 edges all together in K6. Right, so you could have three, uh oh, you have three, six, six, three, five, seven, three, four, eight. Did I do that right? Those are the three, those are the three possible combinations of edges in your graphs. So if you had three, six, blank, well, the blank has to be 15 minus nine. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it has to be. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. So logically, I mean, I mean so if you're thinking of this pure, pure, pure logic, you have to do all yes. the cases. There's really, those are the really ones too. Yes. The other two are, uh, are empty. Yes? Yeah, so your problem deals with the existence of these multi decompositions. Mm -hmm. Have you considered maybe rating a little more? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we, we talked about that um, for about a minute. <laughs> because that's a hard, that's a hard problem. Okay. That's a really hard problem. So one thing is, um, and so one, one difficulty is, okay, I have what I think are two different decom multi decompositions. How do I know that it's just, if I don't order the vertices in a different way, I don't get the same thing. So, I mean, algorithmically, that's, that's a tough one. Uh, I'd like to do that someday. Uh, but, um, but my, again, my, co my colleagues who we used to be math all mathematicians would laugh at me. So maybe Chuck wouldn't laugh at me. He might not laugh at me. He might think that that's doable, or at least we can get something, you know, a, a, a polynomial time algorithm or something like that that would do it. But I, I, I don't know. Another, actually, another interesting question is, we, we, we're, pretty, we're being pretty easy on, like, what, what we demand of our rules for putting the puzzles together. You just have to use one of each one. And I don't know if you noticed what was going on in that one, but you have like one of the 
the, the two squigglies, and then everything else was 3P2. It was, it was kind of a boring puzzle, if you think about it, not very challenging. But what if you did something like, okay, I demand that you use this many of this graph, this many of this graph, this many of this graph, can you do it? That would be, that would actually be a really interesting problem. And for which, you know, is it going to be the case, no matter how, as long as the arithmetic works out, right, that you can make it? That would be, that'd be an awesome theorem, right? Because essentially that's what we did here. It's like a lot of, as long as the arithmetic worked out, except for except for K seven, uh, as long as the arithmetic worked out, you could always find a multi decomposition. And the only time is K seven, which is too close to K six, and then um, when when you when you're forced to have a multiple of three edges. So could you do something like okay, I have a K n, I, I know how big my, my pieces are. If I if I do this number of pieces, this number of pieces, this number of pieces, so that the edges add up to the number of edges in K n. Can you fill that one up? Can I ask another? Of course, of course. Um, so you've been talking about decomposing complete graphs, and mm -hmm. but but you also mentioned you'd like to do this for other you know, sure. graphs. Sure. Uh, that that seems to raise the possibility that you can you know, consider some graph invariants like conductivity or degree conditions or something like that. And do you have any theorems yet of that? Uh, no, we, well, we, we haven't even, we just got into this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so no, uh, well, but, but, uh, you, you mentioned degree though. I mean, degree is, all, is, is very important in the proofs. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, I, this actually brings up case seven. One thing was a really important case seven is using like ba different balance on degrees to show when things could not happen at all. Uh, oftentimes, degrees uh, tell you you can't do stuff more than they tell you you can. They always say maybe when, they, when you think they can, but they say definitely not when you, when you can. So the degree is very helpful. So there might be some more general theorems out there that we can look at. Are there problems in graph theory that a multi-decomposition help you to understand? Like if you want to know something about the graph G, can you break it? That's, that's a... questions about the pieces in T? That's a good question. Um, decomposition in general is important in the study of design, in design theory. I'm not going to tell you what that is because I'm not sure what it is myself. I just know there's a, there's a connection between the way we decompose these things. And, and, and block designs, or I think that's what they're called. They're broken up on the tape. All right, but, um, but, but, but there's some connection to design theory that has, that has some importance somehow outside of graph theory, at least as I understand it. So there are other places. I don't know about multi-decomposition system. Actually, I should mention that this, our, our term multi-design came from that connection between, uh, between decomposition and design theory. I don't understand what it is. Maybe if I can get out of to explain it to I, I don't know of any, anything else that, uh, that hinges on human uh, positions. Thank you all for coming.